Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Mailbag. My name's Dennis. I'm here with... Hey, guys. Perry here. And this is the show where we answer your viewer-submitted questions. How do you do that? You email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. We'll answer them on today's show, tomorrow's mailbag show, and our daily movie talk show. Perry, how are you doing this weekend? I am. I'm doing pretty well. A special happy birthday to my mom and my sister oh, happy, who are se- who are celebrating birthdays. I'm actually not in Burbank right now. I'm in New York. Oh, okay. <laughs> do, do do they watch Mailbag? I know you. I, my mom. I, my mom watches everything. Okay. My sister will only catch videos once in a while, but but Mom and Ems is probably watching this right now. My, my parents have no clue what I do. <laughs> No Did clue. We, have you ever showed them anything? I, like I anything tried you're show, especially I, proud of? I, I, no, I mean, I showed them an interview, I think, uh, with like either Duncan Jones or the Russo brothers once when they were in studio and they still didn't really. <laughs> what kind of movies do they like? I mean, they like all kinds, but, you know, they're, they're not going to watch any indie films and, you know. It's more like what what do they hear about other people talking about? I guess so. go, well, though. that might be the difference. I, I do have a family that is very in tune with pop culture yeah. and, you know, doesn't see as many movies as I do, but they certainly do seek everything out that they can. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, ho- hopefully maybe one day my parents will, will, will find out what I actually do. To celebrate my sister's birthday, they all went and saw I, Tanya at an Alamo draft house. Oh, OK. Yeah. Well, speaking of I, Tanya, I know uh, our, our I'm well, always on point yeah, with you, my segues. Yeah, nice, nice. So our first question comes to us from Harry Green, and he writes, Hey, Collider crew, uh, looking forward to another great day of movie talk. Hey, in biopics, can the actor sometimes overplay the character of the real-life person? I asked this after watching I, Tanya. In the end, you see the real-life Tanya Harding and soon realize she is no way as strong of a person as Margot Robbie. Obviously, she was the real deal in skating, but seeing her in those interviews, I found her to be very soft-spoken and not the angry person on screen as portrayed by Robbie. Uh, what, what do you think, Perry? Well, it's a tough thing to assess. I don't know if I would phrase it as strong of a person mm-hmm. as Margot Robbie. I think it's just the way she's portrayed in the movie, and maybe Margot Robbie's rendition of Tanya Harding had had a bigger presence than what you might have seen in the end credits or just any old TV interview, because I've scrolled through a couple of uh, t- the real Tanya Harding's TV interviews after seeing this movie, and... You know, TV interviews are also a different thing than what you act like behind closed doors. And I don't really know what Tanya Harding is like in her personal life beyond what I've seen in this movie and what I've seen in select interviews. So she could just be putting on, you know, a calm, cordial presence when she's answering questions about her career. But when it comes to any kind of adaptation, whether we're talking about a book being adapted to film or someone's true story being adapted to screen... Adaptation does require change, and Mm -hmm. oftentimes it'll require change to make it a little more entertaining or cinematic. And, you know, I don't want to be the judge with whether or not changing someone's true story for the version that's shown on the big screen is right or wrong. I think that, you know, depending on the subject matter and everything, that, you know, it's a gray area that could be decided on one way or the other. But, you know, oftentimes when you're adapting something, no matter what the source material is, things are going to have to change a little. Yeah, I mean, there was a lot of criticism. These are two movies that I, I think are fantastic, which are Social Network. People say Mark Zuckerberg is not like that character. Mm-hmm. And Jobs, Steve Jobs, you know, uh, the one with yeah. Michael Fassbender. They're saying that's not... So sometimes they do change it to, to make a better movie. I think there's always a danger, especially when people portray real-life yeah. people, because... Especially ones that are larger than life and that are in the public eye, right? Um, so you have someone like Muhammad Ali that, that Will Smith portrayed. I mean, it's very hard to emulate someone that is so iconic and so like ingrained in people's minds. I think uh, you know you have a danger of either doing an impression or doing a parody. I know that was a concern when James Franco did Tommy Wiseau mm-hmm. in The Disaster Artist. Luckily for Franco, not that many people, even though we in in the movie community know the room, we know Tommy Wiseau, the, the average casual fan probably had yeah. not watched The Room before, they probably wasn't familiar with that character. They probably watched his portrayal and go, went like, this character can't be real. But then when you see the, the real yeah. person, you're like, wow, he got it very, very uh, pretty accurately there. So then you have someone like, uh, Daniel Day-Lewis, who does Abraham Lincoln, he gets the benefit of 
none of us know uh, what yeah. Abraham Lincoln like. We can guess when I mean, we have pictures, so but we 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 don't have like video of yeah. Abraham Lincoln talking and his mannerisms, and so he gets to put on you know a, a performance that that I found quite believable, but at the same time I, I have nothing to compare it to. Yeah, I mean. That's kind of the risk you run when you turn someone's true story into a feature film, no matter what. I actually used to run into the whole adaptation question a lot mm -hmm. because when I had first started in this industry, I was very into young adult books mm -hmm. because that's when the Hunger Games craze was really picking up steam. And I had been the only person who had read mm -hmm. Hunger Games where I was working at the time. So I was kind of given all those books. And I had just interacted with so many hardcore Hunger Games fans, fans of other book franchises mm -hmm. like that and just the frustration that comes with like I'll, I'll never forget and I think I might have brought it up on another show because in the book Katniss has an orange backpack mm -hmm. and in the movie it didn't look quite as orange <laughs> and I'll just never forget the endless conversations about like that backpack wasn't orange enough that person's hair color isn't right Peter's mm -hmm. too short Gail's yeah. too good looking what's going on here and yeah so sometimes you got to change things in order to make an entertaining movie well, I, I heard according to John Roca, the YA young uh -oh. adult franchise is dead now, Did you right? really? That's I, on Collider.com. You want to check it out? There's an article. I mean, I plan on going and seeing uh, A Wrinkle in Time in a couple of months, but I don't know about him. Yeah, it's, it's, the it, the it, it is, it's a good piece, though. Yeah. And he, he really dug into the box office. And, you know, I mean, it's a, it is a yeah. fair statement to make when you see diminishing returns on things Divergent. like... Divergent. Divergent. I mean, even Hunger Games to an extent. The second two films did not make as much money as the first two. And then, of course... Quality aside, this latest Maze Runner movie didn't make as much as the first two. Yeah, yeah. All right, moving on to the second question. We have Mark Brewington, and he writes, Hey, guys, if you had the opportunity to write or direct a DC, Marvel, or independent comic to adapt to movies, one not done yet, which would it be? Okay, I'm not well read in comics enough to actually pick something that I would want to adapt, but I will say, and I have to thank Omar Damiani for this because I finally started reading Paper Girls mm -hmm. and that is a comic that is right up my alley. Just the idea of it taking place in the 80s. It's about a group of these four Paper Girl mm -hmm. friends and just the, the supernatural elements that come into play. I'm not going to spoil anything about it, but... That would be, it would be a challenge, no doubt, but it would make for an interesting movie, especially given the recent craze with 80s set coming of age friend type stories, because this has that, but it has something else and it's something unique that at least I haven't seen before. So I don't know. That is the first one that comes to my mind right now. I haven't read it yet, but when we did a comic book mm -hmm. shopping episode, they had, uh, I think it's at uh, Earth 2 comic book store. They have like little like sub, not subtitles, but little descriptions yeah. of each comic book because they're trying to get more casual people into it. Under Paper Girls, it, it said, it's like Stranger Things, but better. <laughs> That's that. That's what the description was. I've only read volume one, okay. so I'm not ready to go that far. But but I'm intrigued big okay. time by what I've read so far. Okay. Uh, one comic book, and I mentioned this many times before, is Saga by Brian K. Vaughn. Which, which is funny because Saga was. This is also Brian K. Vaughn, okay. and Saga came before. So having read Paper Girls and a little bit about what he's done, now I want to go read Saga too. It, it's great, though. I do think it'd be better adapted as a TV series than a movie. Movie. It's like a rated R Romeo and Juliet meets Star Wars. It's like a sci-fi, but it's like kind of violent and perverted. And yeah, so it's okay. weird. It's, it's very strange. It, definitely not for the, the mass audience. So I think it would have to be like on HBO or Stars. Would love to direct something like that. Every time I mention uh, Paper Girls to someone, they always bring up Saga. So I got really excited when you just said cool. that. Well, you should check that one out. <laughs> I probably next. will. Now, the next one, I'm kind of cheating because it is technically the character has been done many, many times, mm -hmm. but this version has not is uh, Superman Red Sun which is an okay. Elseworlds yeah. story. So Superman, obviously, we've had tons of movies that they're going to keep making. The Red Sand storyline is like an alternate universe where he lands in a Ukrainian farm yep. instead of Kansas, and he's raised in the Soviet Union and what that entails and how Lex Luthor is like viewed as this hero in the U.S., mm -hmm. and he's supposed to be you know, the guy that's going to stop Superman because they perceive Superman as this. But it actually, in the storyline, kind of shows that 
Superman in the Soviet Union is actually still a good person. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's you know, but he's just perceived that way. And it's, I it, learned it, it, all about Elseworlds from Schnepp while yeah. we were doing comic book shopping, and a lot of those stories are really interesting. And given the fact that we already have established versions of those characters, I think it would be a bigger challenge mm -hmm. to bring a story like that to the general yes. movie going public. But I mean, it sounds like a risk worth taking to me. Yeah, eventually. I mean, you know, it's written by Mark Miller, Mark Millar, however you pronounce it. And he also wrote the original Old Man Logan, mm -hmm. which, you know, they, I don't even know if they adapted, they took the spirit of Old Man Logan and, and funneled it into, into Logan, but it really is not the same yeah. storyline. One other thing I want to throw out there, if I was ever able to make my own DC or Marvel movie, I think I would be more interested in like the in-betweens, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or from another perspective mm -hmm. other than a super perspective, like just the average everyday person who happened to have seen the Battle of New York or something okay. like that. And I know they tried that with that Vanessa Hudgens show that never really took off, mm -hmm. but I just love the idea of, of either just the average person mm -hmm. seeing what's going on and how they process everything, or even just the in-between battle moments where there's no gearing up for another battle. It's just, you know, it, it was like that Thor short we saw, mm -hmm. you know, and that's, you know, it's a spoof version of that. But wait, what do they do when they're not fighting Well, stuff? you saw, saw Vision was cooking. He's learning how to cook. Yeah. In uh, Civil War, Captain that, America No, that's Civil true. War. I wouldn't mind a lengthier story <laughs> like that. Obviously, it would have to have some sort of purpose, but I, I wouldn't mind a, a longer version of that. Okay. All right. In our third question, we have Comic Book God. And he writes, it's often discussed how a film sets its tone, usually in the early moments of the film. Which are your guys' favorite example of this? One for me is Dread. From the opening monologue to when Dread first uses the hot shot feature on his gun, sets you up perfectly for the film you're about to experience. Thank you for taking my question and have a great day. So the first thing that came to my mind because it's fresh in my mind is, have you seen, you've seen Hostels, right? No, oh that, is, my. that is on my list. The opening scene of Hostels okay. is hands down one of the most brutal scenes I've ever seen. And it just immediately sucks you into that time period, that landscape, mm -hmm. the situation that all the characters find themselves in. I mean, really, after that opening scene, that movie had me. It had my attention, and I was so curious to see what happens to Rosamund Pike's character mm -hmm. more so than anything after that. So I'll definitely throw that one out there. I'm going to say my obvious Jurassic Park. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget seeing that opening raptor scene mm -hmm. for the first time and how much that scared me and how much that scared me with barely seeing anything, too. Just how that poor worker gets sucked into the into the crate and how he's dragged up and down that that used to scare the crap out of me there's also baby driver the opening of baby driver is an exceptional action sequence that immediately sets the tone for the entire movie gives you a very clear taste of what they're going to be doing with the action paired with the music and then another one that came to mind was dazed and confused mm -hmm. because the beginning of dazed and confused basically sets the story up for the entire movie and just the ongoing battle between the seniors and the freshmen. <laughs> I love that movie. Uh, I, I definitely watch that movie a lot. Uh, look, I, you know, we talk about, we've talked about opening sequences before, and I've mentioned in Glorious Bastards mm -hmm. how that sets a tone, so I won't talk too much about that. But other ones are like uh, The Untouchables. Uh, in one of the earlier sequences, you have... Uh, the guy trying to shake down the bar mm -hmm. and the little girl in there and he leaves the briefcase briefcase in there and <laughs> it blows up and kind of sets a tone in terms of like hey look anyone can die in mm -hmm. this movie we, we just killed off an innocent girl holding a briefcase and a bomb goes off well you know we'll take out anyone uh, another one is one of my favorite movies is Unforgiven uh, seeing Clint Eastwood's character in the early beginning he's like wrestling in the mud with pigs he's he can't climb a horse properly he can't shoot a gun like accurately you're kind of set up like oh this is not uh clint eastwood mm -hmm. from uh the good the bad the ugly uh fistful of dollars it's not that clint eastwood it's something completely different oh, i love a powerful opening yeah. that just sucks you right in right off the bat yeah all right, and now we move on to our fourth question. Tristan writes, I was recently re-watching Captain America, the first Avenger, and I got to wondering if Red Skull would return in Avengers Infinity War. Before being sucked up into the universe by the Tesseract in the first Avenger, the Red Skull stated, I have seen the future, Captain. 
there are no flags, referring to Cap's star-spangled uniform. Do you think this was made as was a statement made of things to come now that Steve no longer wears a uniform, and the possibility of the Red Skull returning to Infinity War? I wouldn't be too surprised if he made an uncredited appearance in Infinity War or in the next Avengers film, considering we haven't heard anything about him since. I know. I know many do make a case for Red Skull not being dead, given how that scene is shot in the movie. For some reason to me, having watched Captain America, the first Avenger, and knowing what's coming in Infinity War, Mm -hmm. something about Red Skull coming back doesn't feel right to me, but I'm really just talking about an instinct. I, I don't have any concrete reason why it's not possible for him to come back or why he shouldn't come back. I think if they do decide to put that character in play in the movie, it's going to be for a reason. But more so than anything, when I remember that quote about about flags is just the situation that we see Captain America in right now and what we saw him go through with Civil War where basically everything he stood for was all, like it was tested and almost just pulled out from under him. And he's he's definitely not the same Captain America he was in Winter Soldier or definitely not in First Avenger for that matter. So I do like the idea of going back to First Avenger and thinking about that quote mm-hmm. and thinking about how Red Skull did basically hint at the entire path of this character. Yeah, it's definitely some foreshadowing there. Uh, but I, I, I agree with you. I don't think Red Skull is coming back for numerous reasons. I mean, Hugo Weaving in past interviews has, has kind of hinted and implied that that his experience playing the Red Skull wasn't Mm -hmm. his favorite. I think he's softened up in the recent years. However, I just don't see a place for him. And you already have Infinity War. It's going to have so many characters. Like, why bring him back and even for a cameo, especially when he doesn't have, at that time, was the Cosmic Cube, which ended up being the Tesseract, which Mm -hmm. I think Loki now has. So now he doesn't have even that role to play in it. So I just don't see a point of bringing his character back, at least in this one, maybe later down the line. I I guess it's possible. The only other thing that really comes to mind is is some sort of flashback sequence Mm -hmm. where... I mean, I I wouldn't want to just have him thrown in there to replay this one line of dialogue, but if there was some sort of like added element but again that's just me stretching to find an answer to this yeah and even like reading red skull's kind of comic book history he uses the cosmic cube a lot Mm -hmm. but he doesn't really have any much interaction with kind of the cosmic universe in general in terms of like thanos or you know there's just certain characters i just don't see them having a fit and i don't yeah, I don't see Red Skull coming back, at least not for this movie. There's so many pieces moving around. That is true. I think true. it's unnecessary. I wouldn't be surprised if we finally do see that movie, and every prediction we make is wrong. Yeah, that's Can't true. Can't wait to do a scoreboard for that one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, last question. We have uh, Tyler Descassere writes, Hey, Collider, a huge fan here. I believe that 2017 was one of the best years in film in, of all time, especially for indie films. What are some of your most anticipated indie films coming out in 2018? All right. I'm going to start right off the bat with a little bit of a cheat, but okay. because it's not a big blockbuster movie, I feel the need to put it on this list, and it's Annihilation, which mm. I, I okay. believe Paramount uh, sold that to Netflix, right? Yeah, now it's going to debut on Netflix, but... Whatever, it came with studio backing, but I actually just finished listening to the Annihilation book for the first time, mm-hmm. and honestly, I can't say I loved the book. I don't really think it was it was written in a way that appeals to me, and I think that would make sense to people who have read the book. It's just, like, it's very dense, and it's largely an inner, an inner mm-hmm. monologue, and just the main character making observations, and mm-hmm. I found that a little difficult to get into, but having read it, now I'm even more intrigued to actually see the film adaptation because there are very interesting themes and ideas that can stick with you after so I'm curious to see how they adapt and change that book to fit the film medium and then obviously if you've seen the Unsane trailer from Soderbergh I can't wait to see that movie, especially after his comments where he wants to make movies on iPhones all yeah, the time now. I don't think that's going to last. He also said he was going to I, I, I know, love Steve I Soderbergh know. but Anytime anyone tells me they're retiring or whatever, they're going to do something, eventually they're going to change their mind. Well, and, and I'll, I'll watch what he does with mm-hmm. this one because given what I saw in that trailer, it does look like he made the most out of shooting that way. Mm-hmm. And 
Give me some Claire Foy. I'm not the biggest. I'm not a big uh, the Crown fan. Roka what? keeps Roka what? keeps pushing me to watch it, and I actually have tried to really get into it. And I've gotten like, you know, an episode in at a time, then three episodes, and then okay. a couple months pass, and I have to try again. And I still haven't finished it, but I know that she is incredible yeah. in it, and I want to see what else she can do. Yeah, uh, for me, uh, I have a one is a movie that actually came out in Europe last year, but it's coming out in April this year, which is uh, You Were Never Really Here. Oh, yeah. Uh, the Lynn Ramsey movie that Joaquin Phoenix plays, kind mm-hmm. of this, I, I don't know, kind of like this deadly assassin criminal. I, I, I don't know exactly what his character, but it looks kind of brutal. Uh, the other one, you have uh, Jason Reitman doing Tully. Which is under oh, fo- yeah. focus features, which is Charlize Theron. We've talked about it on Movie mm-hmm. Talk before. Ron Livingston and Mackenzie uh, Davis, I think that's her name. Yep. Uh, so that's a movie I'm looking forward to. And then you mentioned, uh, you know, Annihilation under Netflix, Mute by Duncan Jones. Mm-hmm. Uh, that just recently had a tra- uh, teaser trailer come out. So I'm looking forward to those. I mean, there's a lot of. When I looked at the list of indie movies every year, it's it's there's a ton. The only problem is that maybe a handful of them get any type of attention. Yeah, no, that's true. And I feel like normally this time of year, I'm a little more focused on some of the movies that popped out of Sundance. Mm-hmm. And I think it was a little, uh, not necessarily slower, but I haven't really heard any any people pushing titles as being the next Oscar contender mm-hmm. or, you know, the darling of, uh, of Sundance as much as I have in previous years. But just to throw two others out there, The Nightingale, which mm-hmm. comes from Babadook director Jennifer Kent, I just, I don't care what it's about. I'm going to watch anything that she is attached to at this point. But if you do want to know what that movie is about, it's set in Tasmania in 1825. The Nightingale combines historical drama and revenge thriller as an Aboriginal tracker and an Irish convict head into the Australian wilderness to get revenge on the soldiers who killed the latter's husband and baby. It stars Sam Claflin. And again, I, I like all that. That sounds interesting. And I like Sam Claflin as, a, as a, an actor. But really, what's drawing me to this is Jennifer Kent. Then also that movie, uh, Can You Ever Forgive Me? From the director of Diary of a Teenage, uh, teenage Girl, mm-hmm. Marielle Heller. And it's with uh, Melissa McCarthy. And she plays Lee Israel, the, the one who... Um, Oh, I'm gonna describe this. She was a she was a celebrity photographer, and and she she doctored letters and and signatures mm-hmm. and things like that. And she she made some sort of like financial empire on that. But it's all about her true story. Oh, and okay. you know the idea of uh, Melissa McCarthy being in anything that is not a comedy always appeals to me. Just because when I think about movies like, you know, let's say uh, The Heat and Spy in particular, mm-hmm. when she is given meteor material to work with, she is. Excellent. So, oh, St. Vincent, too. I really want to see her in this. Yeah. All right. Guys, that's it for this episode of Collider Mailbag. Let us know what you think. You can post your comments below. Perry, where can people find you? I am on Twitter and Instagram at PNamorov. And you guys can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero, Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. Thanks to Adam and Cody in the back. And don't forget to subscribe to this YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Collider Videos, and we'll see you guys next time. Hey everybody, Mark Ellis here. Thanks for watching this episode. You want to watch more? Then click up here. Or you can click right here for more great content from Collider. If you haven't subscribed to Collider Video, do so right now and share this vid with your friends. Thanks for watching.